It's a summer savings finale with Dell's Labor Day sale. Get hot deals on some of the newest computers and gaming systems with Intel Core processors. Plus, save on top brand electronics and accessories, all with free shipping on everything. Visit Dell.com slash Labor Day or call 800 by dell That's 800 by dell The Fantasy Focus Football Podcast is presented by ZipRecruiter. Hiring used to be hard. Multiple job sites, stacks of resumes, a confusing review process. But today, hiring can be easy with ZipRecruiter, the highest ready hiring site in America. And now our listeners can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash 06010. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Fantasy, you're in the 06010. Welcome into a sort of special edition of the Fantasy Focus Football Podcast. It's Thursday, August thirtieth in the afternoon. I am Mike. I am Field DH, joined by Mike Clay. I'm not Mike Clay. How's it going? But it's nice to see you. How are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm actually feeling a little uncomfortable because uh, I don't have a jack for my earpiece, so I can't hear anything, and, and it's really awkward. Well, so today's setup is this. Daniel <laughs> is also here. Hello, Daniel. Hey, buddy. What's up? I actually am Mike Clay in one of my fantasy football leagues. A lot of I people saw that. What's that about? your avatar. Yeah. Yeah. To, you know, this year they've expanded the logo pack on ESPN, the app, and ESPN.com as well. Fantasy app, I should say. So you can go and change your default logo to something like Mike Clay or myself or Adam Schefter. Obviously, Matthew's been on there for quite some time. Stefania Bell is a part of it as well. Um, so you're Mike Clay on one of your teams. I am, and I named my team name Mike Clay as well. I just wanted to people think, you know, you're that I was real down smart, Mike Clay, and then I was doing real well. So yeah, you better do well. Yeah, if you do bad, that makes me look bad. Yeah, you are doubling no, down. No on pressure. It. Uh, so we are not in our normal studio today, and for those that are wondering, or we're wondering, hey, where was the live stream today? The reality is this. We had a very special guest here at ESPN today, a group of uh, seven gentlemen, uh, the eighth member of their league was unable to be in attendance, um, who donated and were winners of an auction item in advance of the ESPYs that included the chance to draft and hang out with Matthew, Stefania, Daniel, and myself this morning, which is why we did not have our normal live stream. Instead, we have this audio version of the podcast, which is a great way to catch up on a topic that a lot of people have been asking us. And with Mike here, and you can find Mike on Twitter at Mike Clay NFL, we decided that today, Daniel, will be a perfect day to discuss strategy. Rewind. Fantasy news from the National Football League. This is the instant, instant replay. So we get a lot of questions about a lot of different strategies. We're going to dive into some of them. We're talking about auctions, talking about keeper leagues, dynasty leagues, leagues larger than your normal leagues. But let's just begin, Mike, because the nuts and bolts of our operation here at ESPN are 10 team leagues. And I'd say PPR has become more and more prevalent over the past couple of years, but I think research shows something like 90% of our leagues on ESPN.com are 10 team PPR or non PPR, sort of like the traditional scoring. But let's focus in on 10 team PPR ESPN leagues. And for those who might be new to drafting or just new to fantasy football, I do a piece every year about the rules of drafting, and it's it, it is obviously um, it, it's tailored to not just one type of league but it's probably most pointed towards a 10-team league. Is there a you know quick-hitting guide to a 10-team league, Mike, that you feel like if there are three rules that you're going to abide by going into a 10-team league, what might they be? Well, I'll say this. If you come out of a 10-team league draft and you don't like your team, that's bad. It's that's a, a really bad yes. sign. There is enough talent in the NFL that you should come away uh, with a pretty good starting lineup. And the way to not screw that up is, I mean, we're going to say this many times, I think, over the next I'm, 45 let me guess, minutes. Draft after. on based on value? Draft on, but yeah, draft based on value, of course. That's kind of an, an underlying, uh, sure. or a, a kind of a blanket we could throw on this entire thing. But you wait a quarterback, obviously. Mm-hmm. You don't want to reach on Aaron Rodgers and, and Tom Brady in the, you know, third or fourth round, second round, whatever it is, because you want to load up on the top end talent at running back and wide receiver. And, you know, again, I think in a 10 teamer, I'm not going to move the line too much at the running back position in terms of, you know, where that drop off is. So I would still be trying to, you know, potentially get away with two of the top, we'll say 12. Uh, running backs, maybe the top 13 running backs. I think if you come away with that, you're going to like your team. Uh, At the wide receiver position, that's where you have the most depth. So so again, especially in a 10-teamer, you know, you can can essentially kick wide receiver or punt wide receiver early on, and you're still going to come away with guys like Brandon Cooks, Marvin Jones, Jarvis Landry, who are in your starting lineup, and you're going to be happy with that. And and as for the tight end position, again, I don't think we're going to move the line based on when we we change uh, league size. I think after you get to 
maybe the seventh guy. We're talking Jimmy Graham, Evan Ingram, Delaney Walker. After that, I see a drop off. So I would still try to target one of those guys. I think if you do that in a 10 team, you'll come away pretty strong. So you just mentioned the idea of loading up on running backs early, Mike, or maybe like prioritizing them early. I hear people that often ask the question, should I go running back, running back with my first mm-hmm. two picks in the draft? Which is sort of what you are suggesting there. At the same time, do you ever go into a draft, even at 10 teams, where there is, in theory, value and depth at the wide receiver spot, saying, I'm going running back, running back, no matter what? Yeah, this is uh, one of them, them tricky situations. And I, I've kind of been going back and forth with some people about this on Twitter as of late because it's an interesting topic. So if you start out receiver, receiver, maybe you get Julio Jones and, uh, you know, and, and and Keenan Allen, Odell, something yeah. like that, yep. whatever it is. You start out well, maybe in the third round, you don't like me, see so you take another receiver. When you are when you are done drafting, you're going to look at that roster and say, I, you know, I don't really like it. I'm weak at running back, you know, and you're not going to feel great because there's such a gigantic drop at running back. That's okay. You mm-hmm. know, that's fine because running back is the most replaceable position during the season. So many guys get hurt there and you can work waivers. You're going to add some upside guys to your bench. That's okay. So if you're comfortable with that and you could stomach not having the best team out of the draft, that's okay. But if you start out running back early, which is fine, if that's the value and, and, and the, the draft dictates to get a couple running backs, I think you're going to like the team after the draft more than, than you would your others. But uh, over time, you know, you're, you're just going to have to keep working because guys are going to get hurt at that spot. To your point, I just want to say that one of the things I've gone running back, running back, running back in a number of leagues this year, getting mm-hmm. like at the turn of the first round, being able to get feels like good, huh? Fournette, Melvin Gordon, <laughs> and, like, and like a Royce Freeman or maybe like, a, you know, if Joe Mixon falls, something like that. And I love that, but I wouldn't have done that unless I had mock drafted enough to understand what's going to fall to me at wide receiver. And that's the one thing for me, especially in these 10 team PPR drafts is I did a number of mock drafts where I would take three running backs, one, two, three. And then how do my wide receiver play out? How am I going to take two running backs and then look at wide receiver? I'm going to look at doing two wide receivers and how do my, and so like based on all those mock drafts, it's like, this is sort of how I feel like the most comfortable with my team. And so I know not everyone loves doing mock drafts or you don't have time, but like, I feel like that's a huge thing, especially in 10 team standard PPR leagues, because it's so easy to replicate what your draft will probably be fairly close to. You know, I'll, I'll say this about mock drafting, Daniel, is where it helps me the most is there are players that I say, I'm just not so sure I'm going to roster that player that frequently this year. And some of them are some of the best in the league. Like, for example, Tom Brady and and Aaron Rodgers. I will Mm -hmm. not roster them on a bunch of leagues this year because I think others are going to be more likely to jump the gun on those players than I would. But mock drafts help me because it's like, okay, here I am staring at Aaron Rodgers with pick 53 in the draft, top of the sixth round. I might do it at that point. I'm not doing it 33, Mm -hmm. but at 53... I might certainly consider it. So that's where I think the value of mock drafts in. But going back to Mike's idea about running backs and running back, running back to begin a draft, you know, I understand why so many people are intent on doing that. Mike made a good point about the replaceability of running backs. But again, like I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting there with the eighth pick in the draft thinking it's going to be the pick of Melvin Gordon or Kareem Hunt. And then Antonio Brown is sitting there for me. And I'm like, well, there goes my running back, running back plan because the value is just too good to ignore. 14 team leagues, Mike, same idea, PPR scoring. So obviously it's, it's a little bit expanded just because you obviously have more people involved. How, if at all, does that change certain positions for you? Yeah, it's, uh, man, it, it's, it's really hard to uh, make a, a significant change here in terms of strategy because, again, you still, early on in the draft, you're, you still want to take the best guy. I mean, you don't want to get caught too terrible at, at the running back position, but again, you know, I, you say that you're, if you go receiver heavy early on, it's the same thing we just said for 10 teamers. You can continue to address the running back position later. I'd say at the very least, it makes guys like James White and Giovanni Bernard more valuable, Duke Johnson, because you can almost go into week one with one of those guys as your number two. And you, in a 14 teamer, you're not as, at as much of a disadvantage because you know those guys are going to catch a lot of footballs. And meanwhile, you're loaded up at the wide receiver position. So I would say, uh, in terms of strategy, I mean, if you know, your league mates all take two quarterbacks. You know, you don't want to wait too long at that position. You want to make sure you jump and wait for a run to get going or try to start a run again if you could project that out. But get a guy, you know, in the Alex Smith, Jimmy Garoppolo, Philip Rivers sort of area. Don't get caught with uh, Joe Flacco, for example. And then again, tight end. I, I, I keep stressing this, but I would keep an eye on that kind of five, six, seven area in the middle rounds. Get a Walker and Ingram a Graham. You know, you're going to notice that a lot of teams are shaky at that position. So I would... I would say regardless of format, tight end's a spot to keep an eye on. All right, so, so maybe a little bit more priority on tight end than you would suspect normally. 
Uh, yeah, but I, I think there's that hot spot. You were just talking about, you know, staring at uh, a guy like Antonio Brown in round one. You might be getting into the middle, late stages of round one and or round two and see Gronkowski sitting there or late round three and see Travis Kelsey and Zach Ertz. But there's still going to be loaded uh, loads of talent at running backs and right, wide receivers. So instead of going that direction, know that you're going to have that Walker Olsen Ingram tier three rounds later and you can still come away with a very, very good tight end and you'll be loaded up at the other positions. You know, obviously with more teams in the league, that means that fewer quarterbacks at the very top of our rankings are going to be are, are going to be available for you if mm-hmm. you wait. My tendency on quarterbacks has always been this, and this is not necessarily to say that it's right or wrong. It has just always helped me because it applies to really any size and any format of, of leagues is absent it being something that heavily skewed storage quarterbacks two quarterback plus six point passing touchdown leagues my brand is typically don't be the person that starts the quarterback run and don't be the person that wraps up the quarterback run be somewhere in the middle so i understand that means that i'm going to have less opportunities to draft tom brady aaron Rodgers, maybe you know cam newton or russell wilson if you think those are the very top of the quarterback rankings but you end up comfortably with a lot of teams that roster Kirk Cousins and Drew Brees and Matthew Stafford and Philip Rivers, guys who are going to be legitimate, you know, top mm-hmm. ten options this year. In the meantime, you are prioritizing, you know, running backs, wide receivers a little bit earlier in leagues where people are taking a quarterback two or three rounds late. This draft that we just did this morning was a two quarterback league, and I happened to notice that all of a sudden Carson Wentz was available in like the he was like the 14th quarterback off the board. Wow. You know, so some of that's probably the you know the scare of him not being ready for week one. But every draft, every single draft, there's a quarterback that goes late. And I'm saying to myself, wow, like really, really late. Like even I would not have expected that quarterback to go that late if this were an ESPN staff fantasy league that we were doing. Anything else here on 14 team leagues that might stand out, Mike? And one thing I would also note, and this is... Um, you know, probably universal to any size league, but while we're on the topic of sort of standard scoring leagues, how soon is too soon to jump in on a defense or I'm not, I'm not going to include kickers. How soon is too soon to jump in on a defense? If you are, if you believe, for example, which everybody does, the best one going into this season is going to be the Jaguars. Well, I, again, I think it's, uh, you know, we're, we're talking 16 round drafts here, right? So in general, you're taking your kicker in the 16th, you're taking your defense in the 15th. I think Jacksonville is the only one I would consider maybe in the mid to late part of the 13th round. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I, I'm waiting. And even then, you know, it's pushing it. You know, you look at, I, I would say the hot spot at wide receiver, or like, let's say the hot spot for kind of dart throw upside is the late round wide receivers. I love this group and they're really coming around. You're seeing everybody jump in on Chris Godwin, John Ross, Calvin Ridley, James Washington, Cortland Sutton, Mike Williams. I mean, that is the spot you want to be addressing those kind of guys with massive upside. So, do you take them or do you take a defense? I mean, again, maybe Jacksonville just because they are so unbelievably loaded with talent. But I have a hard time passing on a guy like James Washington or something at that spot. Yeah, it's just that there is so much variance in defenses year to year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, the other thing I'd say about a valuable defense is if you look at what Jacksonville brought to you last year, I want to say in seven of their nine games last year single digit or fewer points. So again, like, you know, if you hit gold with a late round flyer at wide receiver that could be a 10, 15 point per week player, that might be less than what the Jaguars bring to you, even if they're just as dominant as they were last year. Yeah. And by the way, they had a pretty sizable gap over a number two defense in ESPN standard scoring last year. But I'm in other leagues where uh they were seven points ahead of Baltimore. You know, right. it really depends on your scoring. So take a look at the leaderboard last year too, just to make sure there's not a massive gap. That's obviously important, too. Probably the league that we get asked about the most leading up to this time of the year are auction leagues because they are different. They are they obviously are different in many ways than a snake um, or our, our standard leagues, snake or non-snake leagues. Um, but auction leagues are interesting, Mike. Uh, for mm-hmm. those who are unfamiliar, typically or the ESPN default, score, uh, default for auction leagues is it's a $200 budget. And so if you go on our draft cheat sheet... Um, you find players with a little numerical, a little dollar sign and the value next to them. And that is, I believe you put these together, Mike. I do. You know, recommended I do. auction values, mm-hmm. uh, for players based off of their production. I think I, th- I want to say that I saw the m- highest, uh, the most expensive bid was maybe $57 for Le'Veon Bell and yeah, 55 long, for Antonio yeah. Brown. Yeah. 
Anyways, here's how it works in, in auction leagues. For those who have no exposure to them whatsoever in the past, is you get two hundred dollars, and when you are up in the order, you nominate a player, and that player goes out for everybody to continue to bid on, and you know eventually it's like an auction, right? Going once, going twice, sold, and whatever that person is sold for, that is deducted from your bankroll. Um, I think that, and people always wonder, Mike. So how do you approach it? Like, let's start here. How do you approach? how you want to construct your roster because so many people are thinking to themselves like, all right, at the beginning of the draft, you want to get Antonio Brown. And then all of a sudden a third of your budget's gone. So what's your approach generally speaking in an auction? Yeah, I think there is a lot to unpack here, but I do have a strategy. I actually just, I did an auction at the hall of fame in Canton a couple weeks ago and came away extremely happy. And in fact, in that draft, and and I actually, let me start here in terms of strategy. I'm kind of going with this. We'll call it like two by two strategy. I'm going to try and get two really good running backs maybe two top 15, top 12 running backs. It's going to depend how the how the auction's going. Got to be flexible, obviously. And two star wide receivers as well. So in this one, I came away with Christian McCaffrey, LaShawn McCoy, Devontae Adams, and Julio Jones. Okay. And I, and uh, Zach Ertz, again, speaking of keeping flexible, Zach Ertz came cheaper than expected. I think he was like $16 or something, which is well under what I expected. So I got him as well. So I'm, that we're talking, what, five top got five guys that are picked in round one, two, or three? Yep. I mean, if you come away with that, you have a massive edge. So what I would say is budget. Uh, here's what I do. I, I I would say in terms of creating my budget going into the draft, which you should do per position, I would budget six. Uh, it will say eight dollars for kicker, defense, and six bench spots, assuming sixteen rounds. So basically, going in, you're planning on spending one dollar for each bench spot, one dollar in a kicker and defense, which you absolutely need to do. Do not spend more than a dollar on kicker or defense. Correct. Quarterback. Same kind of thing. I'll budget three bucks for quarterback. I got Big Ben in that one, I think, for two dollars, and I got Mariota for a dollar, which uh, was just based on how the, the flow of the auction was going. But don't spend twenty five dollars on Aaron Rodgers or twenty dollars on Tom Brady. You're gonna hand, you're gonna handcuff yourself at running back and wide receiver. That's where you need to spend most of your capital. I promise you, if you're patient, you will get Big Ben, Garoppolo, Mahomes, guys like that. I think Cam Newton went for five bucks. You will get a great discount at the quarterback position. So again, attack running back. Attack receiver. If there's a good value at tight end, go for it. A guy like Ertz, but I think Olsen Walker Ingram will probably cost you seven, eight dollars. That's your strategy, I think, to come away with one of the best teams in the auction. It's somewhat related to, but not an exact facsimile of Stars and Scrubs. For those who aren't familiar mm-hmm. with the Stars and Scrubs uh, strategy, it's as simple as this: you identify, you know, as few as perhaps two players, but as many as perhaps four or five players along Mike's Mike's point that you're willing to pay big bucks for. So, of your two hundred dollar budget, you might spend 170 on those five players and be left over with 30 bucks to fill out your bench, your quarterbacks, your kicker, your defense, etc. And the risk you run is a couple of things. First of all, um, that you, you may not get those players at the top of the board that you want. Second of all, is that like, hey, what I think happens so frequently in auctions that I've been a part of is it's the middle tier players that end up going for the insane values, mm-hmm. right? It's like no hey, question. Wow, like Antonio Brown goes for sixty two dollars, and then Jarvis Landry goes for eleven, mm-hmm. and you're like, wait, 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 wait. I'm not saying Antonio Brown is worse than Jarvis Landry, but he may not be five and a half times the player Jarvis Landry is in terms of value, and he's five and a half times the cost. So the middle tier is where I think you find the most value. So the Stars and Scrubs approach, again, I think it's pretty straightforward. You pay big early, and then you'd be prepared to, your bench might look like, you know, your second wide receiver off the bench might be Chris Godwin, and you might have to live with that. You may not be comfortable with it, or it might be Kelvin Benjamin might be your first wide receiver off the bench. You may walk into a draft normally and say, like, I'd rather not have that be my number one wide receiver off the bench, but if that's the way you end up, that's the double-edged sword of stars and scrubs yeah i think you want to get the superstars though and you want some bench flexibility especially once week one rolls around and someone goes off and has a huge game you know and and you want to you know try and get that guy uh on your roster and have that flexibility but by the way i say two by two just based on how i'm seeing auctions go based on value obviously it is kind of an abbreviated stars versus scrubs it's not terribly different yep but again you can find values in that you know eight to 12 range we'll say in rankings at running back you can attack one of them get another guy in that tier two top 12 receivers and and it's manageable it's something you can pull off i just did an auction and i want to ask you guys opinion on this terrible team I, Dark I appreciate that thank you anyway go ahead i uh, just did an auction draft and one of the guys decided Devonte adams was someone that he wanted to target early he wanted to make sure that he grabbed him so he ended up putting him up for bid very early in the draft 
And because there were so many running backs that people were like, I don't want to spend money on wide receiver yet. I want to make sure and save this money so I can get McCaffrey or Hunt or Kamara. He got Devonta Adams for way cheaper than he should have gone. I mean, do you guys have a strategy when nominating players or especially now with, you know, because running back is something that people are targeting so heavy in early rounds, especially in auction leagues. Like, are you, you know, are you trying to nominate guys that you like knowing that they'll probably go for less because people are saving their money later on? I think the reality is this is my opinion is that and we can get, we can get to the, the nomination process sort of in general is that it's very rare, very rare to find a room that shows collective restraint early on in auction drafts. That's just mm-hmm. the reality of it. Like, you get excited, it's participation, and the other thing that happens is when you nominate a player, Antonio Brown, for example, one of the first players often nominated, people are bidding on him not because they have sincere interest in paying $55 for him, but because they say, well, I'm going to move it up from 22 to 23 because I know, you know, I just want to drive the price up and yep. see, you know, you kind of play with fire there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have found personally that when I nominate a player, and there's a lot of different ways to do it, um, I have a couple different strategies. Early on in the draft, though, and again, this could be flawed, generally speaking, I err towards players that I am comfortable with somebody else outbidding me on. I agree. I just am. Yeah. Like, hey, listen, I let's, you know, and I'm not saying in the first round I'm going to throw up Kelvin Benjamin, for example. Um, but in the first round, if, like, it's hard to avoid it in the first round few picks, but a player that I have said I'm consistently, you know, I'm finding myself being a little bit hesitant on is Jay Ajayi, for example. So I'll put him up there early on in the process because someone might be willing to pay $29 for Jay Ajayi. And I'm like, that's fine because that's 29 fewer dollars they have to compete with me when we get to Melvin Gordon in the next mm-hmm. set of nominations. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. I think that's something you need to keep in mind, but this is all, all why you need to have values in mind for your player. You need a cheat sheet that has a number, which is something I'm looking at right now. I have my rankings just like I normally would, but I have a dollar amount next to. And if it gets past that number, you know, if it's a dollar to no big deal. But I mean, if it goes way above that, now you just know to get out. Just work, you know, there's going to be values later. Don't panic. Like you were just saying, don't don't panic and force yourself to uh, to pay an extra ten dollars over your budget just because, you know, the it it's a good player who's going higher than you expected that's fine you'll you'll find values later i think it's important to know the room which is something we've said already once in this podcast but you know i was doing an auction draft on wednesday the night before this podcast and there were a couple of players that i had been sort of sitting on the other thing i'd mentioned about an auction i think the queue is a very valuable tool in an auction uh as as opposed to i mean it's always valuable right um but the reason why it's particularly valuable in an auction draft is because it's, you know, typically when you're doing a snake draft, a lot of the players taken are like the next highest ranked player. Mm-hmm. Whereas an auction, you might have an idea of a guy that's like way low. Like, hey, listen, like, I really feel as though Curtis Samuel is a sleeper this year. I'm going to at some point nominate him. But I do think there is a certain feel you get to when you're like, you know something? I can tell at this point that people are not just automatically triggering the player's price up on principle. I might be able to slide in there and nominate a player. Um, that I'm going to keep on my team by winning this bid. And I would just say this. I never, except for when it's defenses and kickers, I never go in and budget to pay just $1 for a player that I nominate if I want that player. I just, I just, you know, like there's just too many people in the mm-hmm. room that could go up to two and you might have to get to three. So I never go in with the idea that I'm going to win this player for one buck. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's why I say budget $1 for each bench spot, but you're going to get some, you're going to end up getting some discounts at the other positions. Like right. you're going to have a guy budgeted for $53, say Alvin Kamara, you might get him for 49 you have, you're going to have some money at the end to play with. So I, I agree with you, especially if it's a guy you want. Say you love Chris Godwin. You think he's going to bust out. You know he's only going to go for a couple bucks. Make sure you have three or four bucks to play with, and you probably will. Budget some time. Uh, budget some money for your bench, but also budget some time because it's a lengthy process. But, Dan, do you feel like this is the best style of draft? I love auction drafts, 100%. Once you have done one, I feel like snake drafts are just like, eh. Because the idea that I can go in with an auction draft, like I can decide who I like. If I really love... DeAndre Hopkins, I can go in and if I if I choose to, and I, don't, I hope that you don't, but like you could overpay a dollar or two or three dollars mm-hmm. to make sure that you get a guy that you really like on your team. But the idea that I can construct the team that I want, this guy is a sleeper for me, so I want to make sure that I grab him. I can make sure that I'm getting him. Yeah, and if, if you're a commissioner and you're really serious about fantasy football and you spend a lot of time on it, you should be pushing to, uh, especially if you know if the people in your in your draft or auction maybe have a few too many adult beverages during the draft. It's, it's a great strategy because you will dominate. You know, it's just it's it's tough. You you can't really get bathroom breaks. You 
got to really be focused on every pick. Yeah. Can't disappear for a while, have a beer. So it is tough. It is, and it takes longer. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's the next step. If After you're serious, you've been doing it yeah. for a couple of yeah. years, like take the step, move to an auction draft, and you will realize how much more skill and strategy is involved in the draft process. No doubt. Yeah, I, I love it. I think we all collectively feel as though it is a great, uh, great format. And Mike, I'm glad you mentioned the adult beverage section of it because I find that sometimes I get the best values late in draft, not because <laughs> people are out of money, but because, uh, they are distracted yes. uh, from the bid and nomination <laughs> process. One of my favorite things about the summer, besides auction drafts, is that it offers a nice change of pace. Instead of hitting the treadmill, you can hit a scenic trail. Instead of sweating in a hot yoga studio, you can find your zen on the beach. No matter where you go, there's no better place to fuel, no better way to fuel your summer activities than with delicious recipes and organic produce. There's no better fuel than Sun Basket. Sun Basket makes it easy and convenient to com- uh, easy and convenient to cook healthy, delicious meals at home, no matter how much experience you have in the kitchen. They work with the best farms and suppliers to bring you fresh organic produce and responsibly raise meats and seafoods. Now you get more options than ever. Just go to Sun Basket, go to the Sun Basket app and pick from 18 weekly recipes. Easily cooked dishes that are perfect for the summer, like SoCal fish tacos with avocado and lime yogurt, or fast Greek or salad with white beans, tomato, and feta. The best part, Sun Basket is delivered with pre-portioned ingredients and clear nutrition information, so eating healthy is a breeze. Plus, each meal is ready to whip up in about 30 minutes, so you can get it on the table and back outside. With paleo, gluten-free, lean and clean, vegan, Mediterranean, family options, and more, there's something for every healthy journey and every busy lifestyle. Go to sunbasket.com slash fantasy to learn more and get $35 off your first order. That's sunbasket.com slash fantasy for $35 off. sunbasket.com slash fantasy. Two quarterback leagues, Mike. Those are another popular format we're seeing mm-hmm. more and more of on ESPN.com. And the premise is fairly simple. Two quarterbacks start each week in your league. Some leagues offer an offensive player OP position, which are often also... Two quarterback leagues for all yeah. intents and purposes because quarterbacks have so much upside. Everybody says we got to wait on quarterbacks in fantasy. Does that change when you have a two quarterback league? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, now we, we just did a mock a couple weeks ago, a two quarterback mock, and I, I was up at the end of round two. I was right at the turn. I think I had, uh, the 11th pick, something like that. Um, and or, or I guess I picked second, right? So I was coming back around the turn and I went Rogers Brady, something along those lines. I was comfortable at that spot, uh, the way, the way the draft was going. You know, you still have some decent talent on the board, but I tried it out and I liked my team. So that worked. And then I did last night. I have this, uh, going deep franchise that's going around. We have a, a three leagues in the industry. And that's again, when you have a super flex, an OP sl- slot, which is essentially a quarterback. And, uh, I mean, Rogers went in round two. Brady went in round, round four. I mean, you get deeper. Phillip Rivers, round nine. Matt Stafford, Big Ben, Mariota, Cousins, Ryan, round 10. Pat Mahomes, Jimmy Garoppolo, Goff, Alex Smith, round 11. Yeah, I mean, that's what you generally see. You talked about the value of mocking before. I mean, you do some two-quarterback mocks, you're going to see, you know what, I don't have to force it early on. I can, you know, if I want to have a massive edge at that spot, but you don't have to. You can take stars at the other positions the first five rounds and still come away with two good quarterbacks. So let me ask you this. Let's say that you, in two-quarterback leagues, the reality is, like, unless you go early on quarterbacks, that you may have some, you may have a quarterback with question marks in the back end uh, of the quarterback run, right? So, if you are going to potentially start a Patrick Mahomes in a two quarterback league, um, does that mean like would you feel more comfortable, or do you feel inclined, motivated to find a safer, more established quarterback to pair him with? Are you thinking about the two quarterbacks in conjunction with each other, or are they sort of just, hey, I'm drafting this quarterback now, and I'll eventually address my second quarterback later? Uh, the only thing I think I'd look at, I mean, maybe I don't take Carson Wentz and Andrew Luck, you know. Right. <laughs> I mean, injury, yeah, injury yeah, right. Concerns. Like, right. Yeah, guys that are, are a little beat up, obviously, Luck with the, the foot now. So, you know, that's something I would think about. Or a risky guy. You're right. Like, if you take Mahomes and, and Wentz, who could be hurt, and Mahomes, who's unproven, or Mitch Trubisky could be another guy you could throw in there who we don't know how good he is, that that could be uh, a little bit of a concern, too. But in general, the only thing I'm really going to look at, and, and I almost never do this. You know, a lot of people talk about the value of bye weeks, looking yeah. at bye weeks. I almost never do that. I don't care about it. You know, there's going to be so many injuries and things to change. But if I'm in a two quarterback league, and especially if it's a smaller bench, and I'm generally you're going to have one quarterback on your bench in a, in a two quarterback league, you need another option. I will consider that just so I don't have, you know, need one length. quarterback one week because two guys are on a bye. That's like the only time I would look at buys. Good question though. Sorry, go ahead, Daniel. So that was going to be my question is let's say you have a 10 team two quarterback league. 
you're having 30 quarterbacks that are basically being drafted at that point. Right. If you're in anything deeper than 10 teams, though, are you specifically like are you targeting knowing like I've got to get my second and th- and possibly third quarterback leaving someone high and dry once that happens? Like I think yes. the question differently could be posed as like, do you take a third quarterback before somebody has a chance to take their second one? Because I do. Yeah. I, I definitely am fine with that. Uh, again, last night I was keeping an eye on Jameis Winston. He suspended three games, so you, you're you going to have your two quarterbacks early yeah. on, and you can get Jameis late, so I like him a lot. Uh, and Tyrod Taylor, I think, is a, a nice late-round target. Those are yeah. guys that uh, you can you keep an eye on, but I, I'm with you. I'm totally fine doing that, especially if you get to around 10, 11, and there's still value. Guys on still decent quarterbacks, like, again, Prescott, uh, Mahomes, Garoppolo. I just mentioned some guys that went in rounds 11 and 12, and this was consistent in all three of these drafts and where these guys were going, so... Uh, I'm totally fine with that. Just have three. Just know that you're pretty much locked in all season long to have two decent or better quarterbacks into that in uh, the QB and the OP slot. All right, let's talk about dynasty leaks for a minute, Mike. You are our dynasty guy here at ESPN. You handle all of the rankings on ESPN.com. I believe, I believe they're available through E Plus, right? Is that uh, the Plus? dynasty rankings? Uh, we have the cheat sheet, so they're they're okay. free. Yeah. Uh, so dynasty rankings are available on ESPN.com. Let's begin here, Mike. What's the dynasty leak? A dynasty league is a league where you keep, I would classify it as you keep everyone or you keep almost everyone. So if you, you know, if you just have to drop five guys for a rookie draft, that's still a dynasty draft. Yep. So a dynasty draft, the idea is dynasty league is the idea is like you are building a team that is yours forever. Mm -hmm. In terms of strategy, Mike, that does change things a little bit because you are factoring in not just a player's ability for 2018, but for 2018 through let's say 2025. So if you were to kind of lump these four categories, um, or these four criteria, age, the skill we've shown already, the the situation for a player is in like, is he a starter now? Will he be a starter one day? And his position. How do you sort of prioritize dynasty ranks? I would say skill shown, then age, then position, then situation. Because okay. situation can change in a hurry. Uh, okay. For example, here's a great example. Uh, people worried about Traquan Smith because, well, Drew Brees only has a year or two left. The next day, and that was a, that was, came on Twitter. The next day, they trade for Teddy Bridgewater, who right. again he's he's on a one year deal. He may he not be not there be next back, season. Et yep. But you know, just like you could have did the same thing with the Packers with Brett Favre, and it could have worked fine because he got Aaron Rodgers. You, you know, you could do that. You could have penalized the guy in San Francisco last year, like Marquise Goodwin or Trent Taylor. Then they get Jimmy Garoppolo. That situate the NFL changes so quickly. Yep. You have to focus mostly on talent. That's the most important thing. Uh, age is obviously super important. There's a big difference between Larry Fitzgerald or Mike Evans. You know, they're both similar in terms of short term fantasy value, but one is about 10 years younger than the other. Position is important. There is nothing more valuable in fantasy football than a very good fantasy running back. They are going to get you the most points on a weekly basis. But again, the, the shelf life is so short that, you know, do you want Todd Gurley on your team right now or do you want Odell Beckham? who's going to be around for probably five more years than Todd Gurley. So uh, I think that's an important thing to weigh as well. Again, one variable. It's not necessarily the only thing. And then, uh, again, we, we talked about situation being kind of last on that list. Do you find yourself leaning towards wide receivers and quarterbacks earlier than a running back in a dynasty league because of the unpredictability? I mean, all things being equal, you might be able to make the case that for the next five years, Todd Gurley is more valuable than Odell Beckham Jr. Mm-hmm. But over the next 10 years, it could be that that swings massively in Beckham's favor. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, a tough one to figure out. I, I would have no issue starting out with Gurley and then kind of loading up on a bunch of receivers. You know, get yourself a core guy at that running back position, a core young running back that's super valuable, and then attacking with young uh, receivers. I, I don't think you'll get Beckham in round two, but you can get, you know, Stephon Diggs, maybe Mike Evans, guys, uh, guys along those lines. And as for quarterback... I don't I don't push it too much. Again, you have so many quality options and in Dynasty you probably have a deeper bench. You're gonna be able to keep two guys, you know, and and so I wouldn't I would say you don't force it. Uh one I did a just a few years ago, I had Jameis Winston, I took him to start up, and then I took uh I think I took Jared Goff late in the draft. I mean, and last year Winston was missing time and Goff panned out. You know, you just get two young quarterbacks, one of them's likely to work out. And again, you always have draft picks to, to continue to add there. Yeah, each year you draft the incoming cheap. rookie class yep. amongst players. And also worth noting here, Mike, is um Dynasty Leagues do a great job of keeping people engaged, no matter how their season is going. Oh, yes. Right? You know, hey, listen, you might be five and eight or whatever, make it two and eight after ten weeks and be like, What am I doing for these last three weeks? If you have a no trade deadline rule in your league, you might find a couple of moves. Hey, I only have three consistent players right now, but let me trade two of them and pick up, you know, four bench players from somebody else who are 
you know, trade for a Corey Davis last year, even though you knew he wasn't going to give you a ton last season, but you feel like the long term value of Corey Davis is very high. No question. That's I, I love my favorite leagues are, are dynasty leagues for sure. And sure. I love that concept. In fact, one of the more underrated things across the whole fantasy landscape is going into a dynasty league that already exists and taking over a team of an owner that left. I mean, you, you, you step in and you have this roster. It might be terrible. It's fun. Yeah. It's a fun exercise to try and rebuild with trade for early picks, give up older guy. You know, it's, it's fun. It's like playing, it's more like playing GM than it is in exactly. a season long draft. It's almost like building your own NFL team. You got it. Keeper leagues are sort of like dynasty leagues, Mike, but a couple of notable differences. Yeah. The, the difference being, being again, uh, uh, I guess we should say this. Pretty much every keeper league is different, right? Some right. of them are generic, like you just keep three guys, but this day and age, Pretty much not. It could be you have to give up a certain round. Some some guys have cost. If yep. it's an auction style draft, it there, it goes on and on. The differences. I would say if you only keep one, two, three, maybe four guys, that's where you, the line starts to blur. It's basically season long. You basically yep. just want to keep the guys that are going to help you the next season because you know it's you only have a handful of keepers anyway. You're going to have great guys to pick from uh, the next year. So uh, you could break ties with youth. Youth certainly that you know that's definitely uh, something that can. Can move the needle quite a bit you know maybe if you're deciding between let maybe for example i like levy on bell over todd Gurley with the first overall pick if i'm if it's a keeper and they're both about the same price to me i'm probably going to keep Gurley because he's many years younger so that that's kind of where you, you could break ties but otherwise very much like a season long you know where Gurley's going to be in 2019 and beyond whereas in levy we don't yes. know where he'll be but precisely that's, that's a little bit more nuanced uh, of the evaluation in keepers versus dynasty leagues you know one thing that um like how you decide to keep keepers in your league year to year is sometimes, as you said, Mike, it's just, hey, you get to keep a certain number. Sometimes keeper and dynasty leagues can be auction leagues where it's you get to keep them again, like, you know, their salary escalates beyond their, let's say their initial contract you draft them for is three years, and then every year beyond that they escalate by $5. Sometimes people say if you keep this player, like it is based off where your round, where, what round you took that player in the year before. So like you took... Mm-hmm. You know, Odell Beckham Jr. in the first round, if you keep him, you lose your first round pick for the following year, which the only time where it creates a little bit of gray area is this. Let's say you picked up a player on the waiver wire last year. And you decide to keep him this year. What do you believe is fair in terms of pick relinquished? Should there be one? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I've generally seen the, what I've liked the most is when it's like a 12th rounder. Something like that. You know, you get a really nice discount, but you're also giving up a late round pick. I, I think that's a, a, a good strategy because there's nothing really better than having a super value like that. Like getting like Alvin Kamara last year. Exactly like like Kamara. I think back to and compared to the NFL, you know, it, it, NFL and fantasy aren't are obviously not exactly the same, but you know, think about uh the the Cowboys getting a massive discount of quarterback for a few seasons right. on Dak Prescott. That's exactly the same idea. It's not unfair for you to get a great value on a late round pick in a fantasy Without draft. Without naming any names, I had a friend who's in a league and he happened to pick up Alvin Kamara off waivers last year. And his commissioner didn't have a protocol, so he decided that the fair way. And they asked me for my opinion, and my opinion was you gave up. I told I said, I think you should give up your final round pick okay. for next year or a late round pick. His commissioner decided that um, anybody who was picked up on waivers last year would be the pick they'd have to give up would be their ADP for this upcoming season. What? So he had to give up a first round pick, which I told him was. That is ridiculous. I said, I, of all the things that I've oh, heard. I bet you if the commissioner picked him up, it would have right, been a different story. Yeah, yeah. 15th round pick. <laughs> oh, or, yeah. man. So that, is, that was, uh, oh, that was salt in impeach, the wounds. Impeach him. Not that Alvin Kamara isn't worth the first round pick, but still, like, yeah, the brilliant stroke of, weak. you know, the, the brilliant move last year is offset by oh. the, the, uh, you know, the, the price you have to pay. Do you like the idea of it is, it costs you the round that they were taking in every year? So if I took, Carson Wentz in the 13th every year he just cost me that 13th round or do you want it to escalate every year so it's a 13th and then a 12th and then a 10th and it moves up every year that you have a player yeah I like them when it's like moved up two rounds I think that's the best way to go because then you don't need to mess around with oh I you know I have this guy but I can only keep him one more year this guy I can keep three more years I don't really like getting then you're getting too much and you're getting into like a a, you know a, a dynasty league you might as well have salaries but I just like you take a guy it moves up two rounds every year end of story very simple yep I, I I agree that like there is an escalating price to keep a player. Yep. Otherwise, you know, you could have somebody that gets, let's just say, Carson Wentz in round thirteen last year and Alvin Kamara undrafted and like the cornerstones of their team are locked up forever and they have a well, I guess in on you know, it's like one good year basically makes them a favorite for a long, long time. You know, Field What's that, the, Daniel? With the highest quality socks, underwear, and t shirts, there's no re- need for luck. 
with Stance in your starting lineup. Stance has you covered with all 32 NFL teams so you can support your team with their exclusive styles, delivering the ultimate in comfort and fit. Stance has you covered with basics that are anything but. The Stance R&D team utilizes innovative new technologies to drive the highest quality socks. Their quality yard blends not only give you the most comfortable products, but the most durable as well. Their signature butter blend fabric is like nothing you've ever felt before, utilizing natural products to give you the ultimate softness that only Mother Nature could provide. Stance offers basics in a variety of prints, patterns, and colors, no longer just black and white. NFL socks have multiple designs for each team, and they're not just socks anymore. Stance now makes t-shirts and underwear for both men and women. They have kid socks ranging in sizes all the way up to double XL and underwear and tees, Sizes from small to XL, and they have double XL in limited sizes. Stance has you covered with basics that are anything but. Make game day every day by heading over to stance.com slash FFF to get yours now. Drop the sunscreen and step away from the grill. Dell's Labor Day sale is here with massive deals. Score huge deals on some of the newest computers with Intel Core processors or step up your tech with the latest gaming systems plus a wide selection of thousands of top brand electronics and accessories, all with free shipping on everything. Just call 800 by dell or visit dell.com slash Labor Day. Don't miss this summer savings finale. Call 800 by dell for huge Labor Day deals. All right, a few more pieces of nitty-gritty to get to when it comes to leagues. And let's start with the waiver wire, Mike. There is sort of two popular waiver wire uh, setups. One is just waiver priority. The team with the worst record has the first crack at players in a given week. The other is FAB, which we'll get to in just a minute. For waiver priority, um, I think, you know, there's really not much to say about waiver priority, right? If you have the worst record, like I said, if you have the best record, it makes things more difficult. And although I think you can probably adjust it accordingly um, in your league settings, when you have first prior, like if you if you put first claim in on a player, you don't just stay at the top of the queue forever. You can't just pick up every, you can't pick up, you know, six yeah. good players in the week. You slide backwards in the queue. Um, if you get your top priority pick for the week. The other more interesting one is free agent acquisition budget. We call it FAB, F-A-A-B, and oftentimes it's $100 on ESPN.com for the course of the season. The way it works is this. There's no priority. It's not as if you have a worse record than I do, so you get to you know slide in ahead of me in picking up a player. If you, it's all blind, you bet or you bid $12 to pick up Alvin Kamara after week one last year, and I bid 15 I get Camara. If you put fifteen, and I give. I bid twelve. You get him. Do you have a preference between the two? Yeah, I like Fab. Me too, for sure. Yeah. I, I think uh, it's for the same reasons we just talked about auctions. You know, you you can go after and know you're going to get a guy, and maybe you're the last place team, and you know that in a uh, waiver priority league, you have no chance of getting a guy that broke out in week one. Whereas with Fab, you could spend one hundred percent of your budget if you want. If you feel that great, you can do that. You know, assuming your league allows you to do like zero dollar ads yep. or it has a first come first serve period during the the draft. You at least ha- during the season, at least you have that option. So I definitely like that. You know, you should have uh, your league should be set up to get rid of variance and and luck as much as possible and and put more on the shoulders of the decision makers which are the, the you know the 10 12 16 league owners so fab for sure okay it's really difficult to assign values i always ask people say like hey how yeah. much should i bid <laughs> on this guy this week and it's like okay well how much do you have left what's your total budget how much does everybody else have left what's your team record what's your team roster construction so let's not get too specific on hey in week five how much should you pay for chris godwin but is there a number that you don't want to exceed in week one because you don't want to blow your entire budget? And is there also a percentage of your cap that you want to keep as sort of a slush fund for the last, let's say, quarter of the season? Um, I, I would say, uh, again, and I would take this with a grain of salt, it always depends on the rules a little bit, especially if you don't have, for example, a first-come, first-serve period, which I'm in some leagues, especially in Dynasty, that do not. Um, I, try, I'm, I, mean, I guess I'm a little on the conservative side. I hey, try to yeah. get... I, I try not to get too caught up with, uh, you know, week one, a guy has three catches for a hundred yards and a touchdown. It's like, oh, I got to get this guy. You know, if, if you see a running back come out and I'm trying to think of an example, let's say Christy Michael comes out for the Colts 
He's the clear starter. He gets 15 carries, catches five passes. The Colts put up 35 points. Looks like a great offense. Looks like he's going to be the lead back, and he's on waivers. I mean, you're like, okay, this guy could be a a long-term starter for this team. I should spend up a pretty decent amount. I will say this. The value of Fab drops every single week. As you get later in the season, most of the good guys are picked up. There might be a, a guy out of nowhere that's a sub- uh, a kind of a, a substitute running back that's going to come in and and uh, play a big role that you want to get your hands on. But in general, most of the the breakout players will come in the beginning of the season. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, I kind of feel like it's a little bit of a bell curve. I think it does sort of swoop back up later on in the season because there are players that either because of injury or because teams start to settle up in their playoff race, you can add somebody on waivers, which is why I'm not against keeping a slush fund of like, you know, somewhere between 15, 10 to 15% of your budget available for the last four weeks of the season Agreed. on a just in case basis. The only time I find myself sort of bidding big early on in the season is I don't want to even name a specific name because I don't want to put any bad juju, but like if a top flight player at running back gets injured mm-hmm. and he has a backup that you think is going to carry a ton of value, my contention is this though, like I'd rather you not spend big on fab i'd rather you have handcuffed that player during the draft if you felt as though his backup added that much upside if he got the opportunity to play uh ir slots mike just quickly do you believe that every league should have an ir slot and what is the utility of an ir slot in a league yeah my leagues i'm very flexible with them Uh, i know some people don't love this but i have a deep dynasty league where we have like 50 guys on the roster and i have like eight ir slots and if you were doubtful i let you stash them on during the week and and you can pick guys up but that's probably pushing it i think in general if a guy's rolled out you could throw them on there and add someone to your bench um maybe maybe you know in a a season long maybe have two ir slots yep um but at the very least in you know a dynasty you have to have them or well I'd say a keeper league, you have to have them. Dynasty, your your bench is probably pretty big, so you don't need to. But um, in season long, you do need at least one in season long because guys can come off IR now. Yep. You know, so you should you should be able to store a guy there for half the season and and allow them to come back. I think what one change we need to make though is allow guys on the PUP to go on there too because uh, Hunter Henry, right? He might stick on the PUP throughout the season because they're going to try and get him back for the playoffs, right? If you don't have an IR slot, you're just going to have to, in a dynasty, for example, you're just going to have to sit there or a keeper and you're going to have to hold them all season. Interesting. I had not realized that. Um, but that's good to know. And by the way, you know, an IR spot is in some ways almost just like an extra bench spot for, for in, in some practical sure. purposes. Um, so I'm not against it as well. One last thing I wanted to mention on waivers is I am in favor of a league that runs two sets of waivers during the week. Uh, because here's what I hate. I hate when you have... A kicker gets injured in Friday's practice, and you only have one kicker in your roster, and you have mm-hmm. no chance to pick somebody up, and all of a sudden you're starting no kicker. I like uh, I like waiver period, like Wednesday night, and then first and then, come first serve until you know until week until the, the Sunday game start. Agree. That's another way that would also make it work. When it comes to vetoes, Mike, do you feel as uh, though the commissioner should have you know full judge jury executioner power? No, all leagues should go through. Just immediately, as soon as you're taking, through? the trade should go through. If there's any side of collusion, the commissioner steps in and can reverse the trade. It's very simple. There should be no other. I had a guy today actually ask me. He said he traded Randall Cobb to somebody, and I think he, I, I don't remember who the running back was. It was a, probably a little better player, maybe Lamar Miller or something like that. The other guy wanted Randall Cobb. He, you know, and again, we'd probably agree that Miller's the better player there. He wanted Randall Cobb. The other guy wanted Lamar Miller, and the commissioner was like, no. You know, I decided you're not getting what, not if, what if Lamar Miller loses his right. job week yeah. one and Cobb's Cobb, great. Yeah. And I, I know the it, people are down on him and he's on the trade block, whatever it is. But that's insane. That's just crazy yeah. to do something like that. Not lopsided enough for me. I Here's my feeling on is that if um, first of all, if you have a commissioner that's engaged and like takes his or her job very seriously, then I'm OK with the commissioner being the person that sure, that's fair. overrules trades when they are clearly lopsided, you know, or feel like collusion. If you have a commissioner that's just kind of doing the job because he or she's been doing it for a long time, then I'm in favor of allowing it to go to a league vote if that's what they feel like is the most fair way to do so. Do you think when trades get made, there should be a one or two day like trade waiting period? I no. Think, nope. As right soon away, as the right. trade goes through, because yeah, there right are times away. where like you make a trade on a Friday and it's like, am I going to get that player yeah. for Sunday's games? It's like, even more perilous worse. during basketball season when we're making trades. Yes. But I agree in football, they should go away right away. Uh, last thing here, Mike, just as, and there's, there's no, there's no right or wrong answer to these. What percentage of teams in the in a league should make a playoff? Yeah, by the way, I don't think there's a necessarily a right or wrong answer on the IR stuff either. Yeah, yeah there, I think it just yeah. I, I you know I was given my answer was all over the place. It's you know really it's to each his own. But I, I would say that similar for the playoffs. I think this is what I do. If it's ten teams, for example, I have one Saturday in the commission of ten teamer. 
four teams will get in. You know, no buy. Or, or you know what? Actually, the best thing to do, I think, in that format is two-week playoffs. You know, to, again, remove some variance. Yep. Each round is two is, is two weeks. Um, 12 teamers, top two seeds get a buy, and then, you know, you have you have three weeks of playoffs. Yep. So Semifinals. 16. Uh, I don't... Eight's too much for me, I think. Eight's I, too much. I, agree. I, I don't. I don't know. Eight. Most I can see in a sixteen-team league is seven like teams, six. one with a buy, or two teams. Yeah, with a I'm buy. fine with that. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm cool. I with agree that on that. Yeah. Again, there's no, there's no right or wrong reason. Yeah. I, the only thing I would say on the playoffs is make your playoffs end in week sixteen. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Although our standard, our standard leagues at ESPN go so adjust the standard settings. Yeah. Exactly. Week 17 is perfect for <laughs> DFS. If you've never given DFS a shot, week 17 is the time to do it it's because your standard it, league is over in 16. All right. We, we good? We can give we, it a pause we, there. I'll pause there, and you've got a live read, Mike. Okay. Oh, you have it or no? Yeah, I have it. Go. Football is back, and SeatGeek is the smartest, easiest way to get tickets to every game all season long. Whether you're searching for a last-minute deal, planning a night out, or need to find the perfect gift, SeatGeek helps you find the best seats at the best price is fully guaranteed. There's nothing quite like being there in person and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. SeatGeek is designed to make your ticket buying experience easier than ever. By searching multiple ticket sites and grading every ticket based on value, SeatGeek helps you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. Plus, every purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. And it doesn't end with sports. SeatGeek has plenty of tickets to concerts, comedy, and theater too. Best of all, our listeners get $20 off their first SeatGeek purchase. Just download the SeatGeek app and enter promo code FFF today. That's promo code FFF for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. SeatGeek, life's an event. We have the tickets. Let's wrap this up with some man's league entries, Daniel. Yeah, that's right. This is going to be the last day. We've had so many submissions come in. We're so thankful for everyone, and I wish we could put yes, more people sure in the are. league. Yep. But 16 is already a lot of... A lot of members to have into a league. So here's what we have. We've got 15 people in, excuse me, 13 people in already. We need to put in 14, 15, and 16. Okay. We've got a couple of guys that I'm going to run through here. And I believe there are four emails I'm going to read. One of them is going to be an alternate okay. for the season in case someone can't make the draft. If that doesn't take place, then the alternate will be in the man's league for the 2019 NFL season. Got it. All right. Yep. So this first one we have comes from... Why don't you read... Do you want to read them all consecutively? Yes, I'm going to read them all back to back to back to back, and, and then, then we'll we will decide, talk about them. Basically, what we're deciding is the alternate. Yep. Okay. All right, so this one comes from Nick LeGroat, Dero 6010 For the past few years, I have hurtled over some of life's biggest obstacles to stand in the way... That have tried to stand in the way of me and my championship. Two years ago, my wife went into labor mid-first round of an online draft. We arrived at the hospital 10 minutes before I had to deliver my baby daughter, Willow, in the hallway. Labor lasted 45 minutes. I was able to hop back on somewhere in the fifth round, and with the help of the 06010, I was able to fix my team with some free agent availability over the next few weeks, and I won the league. While Matthew was stranded on an island alone in a boat, I was at home with my one-year-old daughter and wife while four and a half feet of water was rolling through my home in Friendswood, Texas, due to Hurricane Harvey. I lost almost everything and had to walk to a Burger King with shoddy Wi-Fi in order to draft last year's championship team, but didn't come with its own issues. After a mid-season tie with the commissioner whom I was playing, they changed the scoring format to give them the win. I reached out to every member of the 0610 just to get a professional on my side to preach about the integrity of the game, and luckily, Mr. Secret Squirrel fulfilled my wishes and advised that I quit the league and find one with a better commissioner. I'm not sure I would have done that because here I am now applying for the Man's League where mediocrity thrives. Uh, between delivering a baby and the world's biggest natural disaster not stopping me from a championship, I think that I'm all set for the man's league. Do you think you can stop me? So. That's one. That is yeah. Nick LeGroat. Very one strong day. start. Yeah. yeah. It's going to uh, be a hard no, if not. This it's hard to say no. It'll, it'll be hard, hard to say no, no. to that. We'll see. <laughs> all right, this next one uh, comes from Seth and Sam. Seagull Squirrel, Stefania Field, and Matthew, after all the talk about best friends on the show recently was Stefania's reference to the courtship of Eddie's father, I want to tell you all about my best friend. I've been a listener of the 0610 for a long time since the War by the Shore days. Totally was a separate bet, not a part of the board bet, by the way. And it seems like I've outlasted Ronan from Ireland and all your fans from Halifax, but I've been friends with a gentleman for a long time named Sam Scully. We've been best friends since kindergarten, and every year since 10th grade, we dress up as matching characters from Disney and Pixar and other animated movies for Halloween. 
Please see the attached photos. And they attached a bunch of fo- photos of them being dressed up. They were Mr. Fredrickson and Russell from the movie Up. They were Dory and Nemo from Finding Nebo. They were Woody and Buzz from Toy Story. They were Gru and Minion from Despicable Me. Mike and Sully from Monsters e- Inc. Fear and Anger from Inside Out. Shrek and Donkey from Shrek and Mr. Incredible. And Frozone from The Incredibles. So keep in mind, mm. most of these... I was at Syracuse University, go orange, and Sam was at the University of Illinois, 765 miles away. But we would still dress up and take a photo and edit them together. We even did Shrek and Donkey while I was in South Africa. In exchange for entry into the Man's League, we would love to pay homage to two other best friends, Matthew and Field. By dressing up as Matthew and Field for Halloween, Sam would definitely be Matthew since he already has a receding hairline (laughs) and didn't help by not hustling at all with this email. I would I would be Field, which is perfect because I won best dressed in my senior year of high school, and Field is always looking dapper, and I believe that he just finished high school as well. Correct. <laughs> Thank you all for the joy you've brought into our lives. We would love to be able to co-own a team in the man's league. What do you think, Seth and Sam? So this is yeah. one. These are two guys for one entry. One entry. They want to co-own a team together as best friends. All right, let's hear the next one here, Daniel. All right, next one we have. This one comes from Irish Declan. I'm going to get straight to it. I want to be in the league on my time zone. I'm from Ireland, but I live in New York City, and all of my friends in our 10-team PPR league live in Ireland. We're all huge fans of the sport, and we used to get together on Sunday from 6 p.m. until midnight GMT to watch Red Zone. All other U.S.-based sports have midweek night games that are almost impossible to follow in Europe. Secondly, I'm a Lions fan, so I need to be focusing on fantasy to pave over my crippling disappointment every week. I got married back in October, but last year, due to the bureaucracy, I'm still unable to work, which means I spend hours upon hours researching fantasy football. I wait every day with bated breath until 11 a.m. so I can watch the show before going back to bed to do three scheduled hours of mock drafts on the ESPN app. I've also gone ahead and made up some Irish names for the fantasy Focus team. Uh, a lot of people would call this Gaelic, but that's like asking, asking a French person if they speak Francais in English. I realize how tough it is to read these Irish names and speak them, so I've added phonetics to make the read easier. And then he gave us five different Gaelic names or Irish names, which I was going to have Matthew Barry try to read without the pronunciation <laughs> guide. However, because Matthew's not here, maybe I'll try and have them do that next Tuesday or Wednesday based on uh, whether or not we put Declan in the podcast. Thank you for your submission, and may all your first-round picks be bust and injury-free. Regards, Declan McCourt. And Declan did send in the way to actually say it. I have audio of him saying the name, so once mm. Matthew Bushers it, it'll be great to be able to hear. <laughs> okay. And then we have one last one. This last one comes from Michael Geiger. Okay. I can't believe what I'm about to say, and it's going to hurt, but I just want to thank Matthew Barry for making audio recordings for the listeners. My brother, Scott Geiger, is legally blind and loves fantasy football. It's his only way to find out info on players besides me reading them to him. I'm not asking for my entry, but my brother's into the man's league, of course. I will have to help him, but he is the one that got our league together, and we now have nine players that play on ESPN's fantasy site. I work midnights, and my coworkers think I'm crazy when I yell, put it on the board, when you make board bets, and all the days my daughter was, uh, of of course, also, My daughter was born on the same day as Matthew Barry, and I know it's a long shot to be invited, but if you could at least acknowledge my brother and the audio to be able to say everything that you guys do to help the blind, it means everything. Before I sign off, I just want to say thank you to Fields, Stefania, Daniel, for at least trying to keep Matthew on track, but he is a train without tracks, unfortunately. Thank you. That comes from Michael Geiger. So those are the four that we have. So just quickly to reassess all of them, it is Nick LaGroat, who is basically a disaster baby or had a baby and then also a disaster, but he won two championships. Uh, we have Irish Declan, who was from Ireland, would like to be in the league this year with yep. people in his own time zone, made up Irish names for us. We have Michael Geiger uh, and his brother, who is blind, that is very thankful for what it is that we do, especially for any of our blind listeners, being able to help them consume fantasy football. And then we have best friends, Seth and Sam, who dress up every year as uh, Disney or Pixar characters, even though they live 765 miles apart, and they want to dress up as Field and Matthew for Halloween. All right. I think by... So here's what I would say, is I'm going to start by saying that the very first entry that we heard about, a man who left his... Mm -hmm. uh, You know, had to... Attended his wife's delivery. He's dealt with some personal hardship uh, due to the weather and the natural disasters. Obvious one for me. Yeah, me too. All right, one hundred percent. Yep. So uh, can we? I'd like to call him Disaster Baby Nick. 
I just put the two together. He's okay. not his baby's yeah. not a disaster, but <laughs> right. disaster baby Nick. Let's do it. All right. So disaster baby Nick, welcome, welcome to the Man's League. League. Put it on the board. That one was too easy. It was, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, it was great, great submission. I okay. also would, I would go to the bookend here. And the last one, um, could you remind Seth me? Seth and the, Sam. Seth, nope, no, the last one here. Michael Geiger. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Michael yeah. Geiger, who is writing sort of on behalf of his brother, uh, sounds like an inspiring story. One that, um, you know, we talk about the importance of fantasy football in so many ways, but it brings people together. Uh, and it's a bond that, some people share when they are distance apart, whether it's you know your college friends you continue to play with or whatever it might be. That one to me struck me as another one that I feel strong candidate right We're there. We're on the same page. All right, so I think another one has to be Michael Geiger. Yep. All right, so uh you want to say Michael Geiger, what is it that we can call their team name? Not Jake Olson. <laughs> that would be that would be pretty good. I Jake like Olson, not, the, who said, who's, who's the who's the official uh, blind listener of the 06010. Yeah, so let's do not Jake Olson. Actually, that's pretty funny. I like okay. that. Not bad. Okay, here we go. All right, so not Jake Olson. Welcome, Welcome to the Man's League. League. Put it on the board. We can work on our synchro- on our on our, our syncing and all that. Anyways, let's <laughs> keep it rolling here. Um, so we've got two to choose from, and it is the best friends that dress up as each other, or yep. it is the Irish Declan who has come up with Gaelic names for all of us. Now, maybe the Gaelic names would carry more prominence to me if we actually heard them, and I get it. But still, I actually felt like the entry for the two best friends was a little bit stronger, and it would be a nice way to pay homage to my best friendship with Matthew Barry. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm jumping. I, I'm, I'm sort of taking the... Uh, I'm taking the bull by the horn here, Mike, but if you're okay with it, that feels like the way to go. Yeah, I agree with you, and also, I mean... They're dressing up like Disney characters. We work for Disney. I, I mean, that's seamless, right? That's it, that's perfect. It so feels uh, pretty good. Th- I mean, in fairness, it's like picking between Gurley and Bell here, right? You know, there's really not a wrong answer. Two great candidates, but I got to go with that. Plus, I want to see the pictures of them dressed like Field and Matthew. Hundred percent agree. Yeah, hundred percent. So, best friend Seth and Sam, welcome, welcome to the Man's League. League. Put it on the board. All right. So then we have an alternate as well. We've got. Um, so, how does the alternate work? Is that like if if someone can't make it to the draft? Yeah. If someone can't make it to the draft, if they say, "Oh, you know what? Unfortunately, I'm you know my grandfather's seventy fifth birthday is that day. I won't be able to make it." Then that person will become an alternate for next year, right? And Irish Declan will take over for his spot. If that's not the case, then as this year's alternate. He will be the first person in for next year's. There you have it. We fill out our man's league. We fill out our women's league as well. Is that correct, Daniel? That is correct. Both of our listener leagues are taken care of, which a big thank you to ZipRecruiter for sponsoring both the man's league and the women's league. We're really excited about both of these this year. And you should have an email in short order about coordinating the draft. Obviously, the clock is ticking here, so expect that at some point uh, in the near future and be ready to respond with dates that work for you. In the meantime, a big thank you to Mike Clay for filling in today, and Daniel, of course, for orchestrating it. We are back on Friday with a special show. We're back on the Twitter tr- Twitter stream at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Follow at Fantasy Focus for more information. We're going to do a mock draft. Matthew and I will be doing a mock draft, and we're going to go back and forth, and we're going to talk through some picks and selections and notable things that come across our purview. Until then, we'll talk to you guys manana. Peace out.